This week, departing and arriving, surviving and decrying. All the hogs want to belly up to the billion dollar trough and suck out what they can. It's a week for mourning, for marching, for comprehending, the cost of compromising and for deciding. Your candidacy guarantees Chris Kobach's victory. I think that's nonsense. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes, ready to serve you as we look back at the news of the week in this place we call home. Our mission, to make sense of those big local stories, making the headlines on both sides of state line, feverishly working to keep you up to date on what you need to know, the Kansas City Star's chief political correspondent, Brian Lowry, from the Shawnee Mission Post, Jay Center, columnist and star editorial writer, Dave Helling, and the head of the Kansas City Star editorial board, Colleen Nelson. 14 months after the rumors first started that Sam Brownback was going to get a job in the Trump administration, the Kansas governor is officially leaving, Vice President Mike Pence breaking a tie vote in the United States Senate to confirm Brownback as the new ambassador at large for religious freedom. On this vote, the yeas are 49, the nays are 49, the Senate being equally divided, the vice president votes in the affirmative, and the nomination is confirmed. It's a key post. It's an important one. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to work. We're going to be working on changing the tone. Uh, we've got some difficult issues to deal with, and we're going to deal with them. That's the man who will now become governor of Kansas, Jeff Collier. For all the talk of bipartisanship, not one Democrat voted for Brownback. During his time as governor and here in the Senate, Mr. Brownback often used religion to push policies that undermine the right of women to access health care, control their own bodies, and determine their own destinies. As much as I know the people of Kansas wish to see Governor Brownback sent abroad and out of their state, I cannot support his confirmation today. Of course, that's just one perspective on the governor, but is Brownback now immediately turning over power to his lieutenant governor, Johnson County plastic surgeon, Jeff Collier? How does that work, Brian Lowry? So uh, Brownback officially resigns Wednesday, and immediately upon his resignation at 3 p.m. Wednesday, Collier will be sworn in as the 47th governor of the state of Kansas. Uh, it was... I was at the state house the day of the uh, of the confirmation vote. Uh, it was a very intense day there. Brownback, when they were doing, they had to do two votes to approve him. When they were doing the first vote, it was deadlocked, 49-49, and Brownback had to chair a state finance council meeting, and he was not in a great mood. And when it, the council meeting had ended. The deadlock still had not ended, and he got swarmed by reporters. He was not really willing to answer any questions until I saw a tweet from our Washington correspondent, Lindsey Wise, and I could show Pence broke the deadlock. You, he passed culture, he passed culture, and then he was willing to answer questions and said he was delighted that the vice president was in his corner. You know, we hear lots about bipartisanship, particularly from Claire McCaskill of Missouri, who said she's not there to fight uh, Donald Trump, she's there for the Missouri voters. Why did she even vote against Sam Brownback, uh, uh, Colleen Nelson? Well, she is there to fight Donald Trump sometimes, and okay. so she kind of picks her spots on this. And, and from Claire McCaskill's perspective, there's really no consequence for voting against Sam Brownback. I mean, he's, he's one of the most unpopular governors in the country. He's unpopular in Kansas. You, you saw from the reaction of many Kansas Republicans that they were happy, that many of them we're happy to see uh, him go. And so, I mean, when you have Kansas, some Kansas Republicans saying that he was the worst governor in Kansas history, I don't think that McCaskill is going to suffer consequences for that. I mean, she's an imperiled Democrat running in a red state, and, and she could be in trouble this year, but not because she voted against Sam Brown. Now, I'd like to believe there were some people in Topeka uh, this week who were sobbing behind closed doors because they are sad that Sam Brownback is leaving. But a Johnson County senator from your neck of the woods there, Jay Center, did say, and that is um, Mission Hills Republican Barbara Bollier, I think he has been the worst governor ever in Kansas in my lifetime. But he must have done something right. Hey, you will be uh, hard pressed, I think, to find somebody in the Capitol right now who's going to go out and tell you what they think that great thing that he contributed to the state is. 
you know, in 10, 15, 20 years, maybe uh, history looks back and says some of the initiatives that started under the Brownback administration have morphed into something positive. Um, but the, the lack of allies that he has behind him in Topeka right now is, is truly remarkable. And the fact that Vice President Mike Pence was required to, to come in and aid his friend and break that tie really highlights how thin a thread Sam Brownback was hanging on to his public life over the course of the past eight months. There must be something he did positively, Dave Helling. Well, we wrote an editorial, you know, this week saying, in essence, uh, good or bad. Sam Brownback approached his job in good faith. There's no evidence that he wanted to ruin Kansas or that he somehow thought that, boy, whatever, uh, you know, I propose certainly isn't going to help the state. So he approached his job in good faith, and he truly loves the state. He was just dead wrong and repeatedly offered the opportunity to correct the wrong. He refused to do so. He's not and he leaves the office with Republicans mad at him for this last-minute $600 million five-year offer on schools, the few people who might have sobbed about his departure are not sobbing either. I mean, he, virtually but, but everyone is that, angry But there must now. be some people who are happy, and that includes, he, didn't he say that how many thousands uh, of children were saved, as he put it, because of his changes in abortion laws? He, he has said that. He has made this claim over and over again, although it's a fairly disputed claim because the abortion rate has dropped nationally, it tying uh, the, the rate of abortions going down to state policy is a very complicated matter. I, do, I just think we I, it needs to be stated that he's not leaving in triumph. Uh, this is not a high-profile position. The first position that he had been rumored for a, more than a year ago was Secretary of Agriculture, which is a high-level position. Um, even people... Um, who think that this ambassadorship for international religious freedom is important will tell you that it's not been a priority in U.S. foreign policy. This was Brownback's friend. Mike Pence was the one who was pushing for him in Washington and also was the one who rescued him. And he's leaving a state where even his closest allies over the course of seven years have become incredibly alienated by It's him. been some time since this appointment first started, and we talked about it on the program, but one of our crew members even asked this morning, what does that job actually do? Can we just briefly say what the job it's will actually the state, what he'll be doing? It, it's with the State Department, and there is a staff, and they do what they can, Nick, to oversee uh, allegations of religious persecution in other countries and then make a public statement about it or try and involve the United States in trying to solve that problem or bring some moral force to bear. It is a second-tier job. And it's also telling, by the way, that Donald Trump never really went to bat for Sam Brownback. It isn't as if Donald Trump was saying, I have to have this nomination, I have to have it approved. He never really put uh, much political capital on the table either. That's uh, another sign that it was not, uh, it's not a first-tier job. Jay. Well, and the, the interesting thing, I mean, Sam Brownback's Catholicism is absolutely fundamental to him as a person, and it's been fundamental to his political career. But because it has been so front and center, you have a lot of people People wondering if in this role as the defender of religious liberty uh, around the world, is he truly concerned with religious liberty for all faiths or just conservative Christians? I know the focus now is on the person who is going to be taking this job, Jeff Collier, a plastic surgeon from Johnson County, who has just six months now before a primary election in Kansas to make a name for himself. Are we any wiser about him as we sit here today, Colleen Nelson? We're not a lot wiser. Uh, I mean, he has refrained from really uh, coming out and, and saying what he would do until he was actually going to get the job, because this dragged on for, for so long. There was an expectation that the handoff would happen much sooner. He expected to be giving the state of the state address, and lo and behold, Brownback hadn't been confirmed. Brownback, uh, at the last minute, said, I'm still governor. I'm going to give state of the state address. And so that was a missed opportunity for Collier. It's up to him now to tell us what he's going to do, particularly what he's going to do differently from Brownback, because in Brownback's shadow, he really didn't ever differentiate himself with Brownback from Brownback. And he's saying now things are going to be different, we're going to have a different tone, um, and he's saying he's going to be more collaborative than Brownback. But if, if the substance is still the same, if he still is in the same place on policy, I'm not sure how much it matters if the style is a little bit different. Is it just a tone difference, he's Brian? He's pretty close to Brownback on policy, but his, he does have a different style. He's probably more willing to compromise than Brownback. And if you talk to lawmakers, uh, including Barbara Boyer, who, uh, as 
as we know, called Brownback the worst uh, governor in her lifetime. Just one perspective. Um, yes. <laughs> she's, she actually talked to me about how excited she is for Collier coming in because what he's done, and he started doing this uh, more than a year ago, he's really anticipating that he would be stepping in the top job, tried to rebuild relationships with lawmakers, which had become very strained, tried to rebuild relationships with the press, quite frankly, which were never uh, Sam Brownback's strong suit. And so one thing, Collier likes to maybe listen a bit more, whereas Brownback, when he had his position, as you saw on taxes and a number of other things, he dug in. Collier is probably as conservative as Brownback, but maybe a little bit more malleable, maybe a little bit more open to compromise. Yeah, but, but let's be clear, he takes the office of governor at a time when the mathematics are pretty stark. I mean, the legislature has to figure out a way to address the court's order on schools. $600 million is mentioned typically as the target. The governor-to-be has said he's not interested in tax increases. He's on the ballot to, in the primary in August, so tax increases are going to be difficult as a political matter. Uh, you know, he, he, it, for all the goodwill that you will see, Nick, it's going to be a tough road to hoe this year. Two weeks after acknowledging an extramarital affair but denying he blackmailed the woman to keep it quiet, Missouri Governor Eric Greitens came out of hiding this week. There was no threat of blackmail. There was no threat of a photograph in blackmail. Those things are absolutely false. There was no hush money. There was no violence. The Missouri governor taking part in several on-camera interviews and even hosting a press conference where he apologized one more time and outlined his budget priorities for the upcoming year, which rankled university leaders after he proposed cutting nearly $70 million from their budgets. We'll get to that in just a moment. But is it fair to conclude that Eric Greitens has now survived Colleen Nelson? For the moment, you have not seen more lawmakers coming out and saying he should resign. And, I mean, we had five Republicans come out and say he should resign. There are uh, obviously plenty of Democrats who think he sh should. Uh, at the moment, he has survived. Uh, but the question is, is there going to be more information coming out? There's an investigation that's underway. We don't know what more we might learn. And he certainly hasn't answered all the questions uh, that, are still, that are still floating out there, particularly about blackmail. And, you know, he said that there's not blackmail. He didn't blackmail anyone, but he won't answer questions about whether he photographed the woman in a compromising position. And uh, and so there, there are still questions. He will stay in office for the moment, but he is severely wounded. Brian. Uh, well, certainly. I mean, he is, he is in a position where uh, he won't answer this very direct question with a yes or no answer. Did you take a photograph of a woman while she was blindfolded, nude, with her hands bound? Uh, I can answer you that with a no for myself, but the <laughs> governor won't answer that with a yes or no uh, question. So, I mean, that's going to be something that continues to haunt him. And as this investigation goes on, if we learn more, that's where he's going to be in trouble. Uh, talking to Republican operatives, most Republicans are waiting to see the results of the investigation. They are waiting for that. And keep in mind, there was another bit of news uh, which isn't necessarily related to the blackmail. A lot of people have connected it, but it's not necessarily related that there is perhaps a federal inquiry uh, into Governor Greitens, possibly dealing with his use of dark money. That's going to be something where we're going to continue to maybe hear drips and drabs. And when he comes to the Kansas City area next week uh, to promote his uh, tax tax plan, that's where I think we can maybe get a sense of how confident is he in the job. Well, that is, says is how he confident back? he is that he's yeah. out and about. And he was doing a press conference this week. He was outlining his budget, including uh, cutting uh, higher education money, though doing many other things. Celeste, on our Facebook Live program, which we do every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, asked us uh, what is the impact of that $70 million in cuts on our region to higher education? Well, I don't think the Board of Curators, uh, Nick, has uh, precisely uh, decided decided how it's going to apply those reductions to all of the colleges in the system. And frankly, uh, the, the bigger impact from the Governor Greitens scandal is that lawmakers are, in essence, telling him to take a hike. They're all Republicans have already said, we're going to do our own budget. So it's not clear those cuts will ever become enacted if the legislature steps in. So, um, uh, you know, the, but, but it's clear that the governor has made higher education a prime target. And, uh, you know, for, to the detriment, we've argued, uh, of Kansas City and the entire state of Missouri and the entire region. And uh, we'll see if the legislature pushes back against that. And it's not as if it's any different, though, on the Kansas side, Jay. Uh, 
No, no, I, I don't necessarily think so. Um, you know, the, the higher education is, is under the uh, gun everywhere. The, the really um, discouraging thing is that these those institutions of higher education across Kansas, um, uh, they, they do create jobs, they do create innovation, uh, and as those budgets uh, uh, get reduced and they become more affor less affordable for people because uh, tuitions go up, uh, it, it really reduces their impact on the uh, Can community. I just say quickly, there was a report this morning that uh, uh, Julie Irene Kaufman had, or the, her foundation has removed a key component of the downtown arts campus for UMKC, which suggests that whole project is in serious jeopardy now, in part because, in large part, because the governor vetoed the state money for for the project. So that's where it really matters. I mean, it matters to that block of Kansas City. It matters to UMKC. It matters to the people who want to stu uh, study dance and music in, in the state of Missouri. And so these things have real world consequences. Many Kansas Cityans started getting robocalls this week demanding that they call City Hall to urge council members to reject Edgemore and pick a new team to finance and build a new look KCI. A frustrated Mayor James is now lashing out. Now we have to get through all the nonsense all the politics, all the hogs wanting to belly up to the billion dollar trough and suck out what they can and to do it any way they can. We got these robocalls going out there saying all sorts of nasty stuff. Now, let's ask, let's ask this question. Who do we think's doing that? It sure as heck ain't the city. I assure you it's not Edgemore. But somebody has some interest here. So who are these hogs, Colleen Nelson, that the <laughs> mayor is referring to? Do we know? That's a fantastic question uh, and a question that's a, in a little bit of dispute because I think a lot of people in the room thought he was talking about unions. Right now there's a lot of wrangling between unions uh, saying that they want this to be a 100 percent unionized project. That's problematic because Edgemore says they need to meet a target for women and minority owned businesses. And if they are going to meet that target, they're not going to be able to use 100 percent. Uh, union labor. And so uh, unions have been viewed as a little bit um, as of a holdup. This is creating a hurdle in these negotiations. So I think a lot of people in the room thought he was talking about unions. He later came back and said, well, no, that wasn't aimed at unions. But then when pressed on who exactly he was talking about, he said, well, people who's, who want to benefit from this process. OK, so we don't know. But how about the robocalls, though? He says that that's not the city putting out those automatic electronic calls that come to your home. And it wasn't Edgemore. So who is it then? Well, we don't know. And that's, of course, a big problem that we don't know. It's obviously some group or someone trying to influence the council's decision, Nick, which should not be based on robocalls. It should be based on facts and evidence and the memorandum of understanding with Edgemore. And so we were critical of it for that reason. However, it turns out that Edgemore made its own robocalls, to which it admitted calls that, in essence, asked uh, voters to call City Hall and say, vote for Edgemore. It's really a silly way to try and make this billion dollar decision. It distorts the process uh, and it should not influence what the council decides, which, by the way, it may decide as early as next week. It's just fascinating that political campaign tactics are now being used for, for a city council vote. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, you don't even know the political tactics we use behind the scenes just on this program right. itself, right? <laughs> That's how local well, it has become. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it, it's, it's Steve Vakrat uh, from The Star has been doing great reporting, uh, as have other uh, people on the team. But it, it, to me, it's just kind of fascinating is this is something, you know, every October we start, we start you know, having to chase who's behind these anonymous calls, uh, you know, slandering a candidate or, you know, I had to one time look into to accusations against the candidate that he was a communist because his company did trade with China, which isn't a very communist thing to do. And it's like, it's just fascinating to see this with a city council procurement vote, but that shows you how much money is at stake here, how much people see a chance to gain and, or and, lose on this. And, and just to emphasize Brian's point, that's what the mayor was talking about.
about when he talks about hogs. What he's talking about is a lot of people have a stake in what the council decides, and that's why there's so much pressure being brought to bear. Well, one of the big national issues of the week was the government shutdown. Missouri Senator Claire McCaskill was one of only five Democrats who uh, bucked who, uh, people in her own party in the Senate to side with Republicans to try and keep the government open. Now there's a top ten list of politicians circulating of those who stand to be the biggest losers from that event. And on it are Missouri Senator Clem McCaskill. But also on the list is Congress Congressman uh, Kevin Yoder. Clem McCaskill tried to keep government running. Is she really going to pay a price for that, Colleen? Well, Republicans are working really hard to try to make her pay a price. And so I guess the question is, how, how much attention are voters paying? Because if they're, if they're paying attention, they saw that she voted to keep the government open. They saw that she came forward with uh, a measure that would have paid military while the government was shut down. And they saw that she worked over while the government was shut down very hard to strike a deal and get it back open. And, but Republicans are putting out ads saying, calling it the Claire McCaskill shutdown. So question is, do voters believe the commercial, or do they actually look at what she did? Now, how did mild-mannered little old Kevin Yoder manage to be on that list? What, <laughs> That's a great what, question. <laughs> what in any way would this have to do with implicating him in consequences? You know, I, I was very surprised to see him on that. I, I can't imagine that this particular issue, the government shutdown, is going to be problematic for him as he, he looks for re-election. The demographics of Johnson County and his district, however, are incredibly problematic for him as he's looking toward re-election. Uh, you look at the Republicans' performance during the Trump era in elections in Virginia and Alabama, and it is affluent, well-educated suburban voters like those who live in District 3 who have bucked the Republican Party and the Trump agenda uh, hard, very hard. And Kevin Yoder um, has been very adept in his career at shifting to the political winds. It has been very difficult for Republicans, though, to put any distance between themselves and Trump. So Brian. we'll see how that goes. I'm skeptical that the shutdown is going to have much bearing on the 2018 elections in general because it was such a short shutdown. It wasn't a prolonged shutdown like in 2013. When Harry Truman's boyhood home is closed, even for one day, <laughs> that is a but, major issue for me, Brian. Well, uh, and I... <laughs> Noted. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will say also, McCaskill, it, it, it's not just that she, how she voted. Susan Collins, a Republican from Maine, even, even told the star about everything McCaskill did to, uh, to get the final deal together. She was a real key player in bringing the rest of her party line. Now, where she has seen some attacks in addition to the Republicans is there are some progressives who are annoyed with her for not standing the ground with a lot of the Democrats on DACA. And I, I would say just in general, the Democrats did lose this shutdown in the sense that they didn't gain anything from their stance. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't willing to really take the stand for long enough that the shutdown would have had an impact. You know, even most services that could be impacted by a shutdown weren't, weren't other than like national parks and things like that, weren't impacted. The states were still running the WIC programs. They were still running all of that federal funding. They still had a good stockpile. So it was really more of a political fight that lasted a weekend. It's probably more interesting to the people at this table than the average voter. Okay, well, let's move on then. Well, a year ago, one of the biggest stories in Kansas City was the thousands of women gathering downtown for the Women's March this past weekend. Cities across the country host a second year of rallies, but not here. In fact, so frustrated were some local women with that move that they hosted an impromptu march near Swope Park. Women wanted to take part in a more organized rally, had to head to Lawrence. If it was so successful over the first time, why no big rally here in Kansas City, Colleen? Well, I think that's what a lot of people were asking. And the organizers who put on last year's march said that they were focused um, on getting women elected and that they wanted to stay focused on that. But I think a lot of people would argue <laughs> that a rally like that is a good way to bring attention to efforts to get women elected. And, um, and so I, I feel like this people could view this as a missed opportunity for those who are inclined to 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 march and to work with these groups that want to get so they're women trying elected. to get more women elected which is curious because the star run an editorial this week also lamenting the absence of women in elected positions particularly in one of the biggest parts of our metro johnson county in fact they claimed for all the changing diversity and young families coming into the county leadership is still made up almost exclusively of older white males jay center at the shawnee mission post you ran the survey that formed the basis of that editorial what did you actually find there and what are the significance of that well uh 95 percent of 
of uh, city council or school board members in the Shawnee Mission area uh, are, are white, and about 66 percent of them are male. Um, I, I think this, this highlights the fact that these are volunteer positions, by and large, or if they're paid, it's a, it's a sort of a paltry amount. Um, and if you're going to do the job, you really need to devote 10, 15, 20 hours a week to it. Um, if you are a two-income household, if you have young kids, uh, it's very difficult to make the uh, commitment to donate that time. So I, I think if you're looking to get more people involved, these cities should actually try to make their positions worth people's time to do. Okay, but Brian, if you, when you think about this election, though, because this is about the past, w w the lack of women in leadership, but are you seeing along the landscape in Missouri and Kansas more women running for office than previous election cycles? Well, I mean, the, one of the main races I'm following is the Kansas governor's race. And as you know, we have about, what, 25, maybe Thousand 100 candidates? candidates? Yeah. There's one woman. And it's a it's woman. woman, Laura okay. Kelly, a Democrat from Topeka, who is very experienced lawmaker, served on uh, in prominent roles on budget and health committees. But it is striking that she did not get into the race until mid-December, that we had all of these announcements and that we had two dozen men and several teenage boys come come forward uh, before we had um, one woman announce that she was going to run. So I don't know why to tell you that is. Given but all of the movement we're seeing, why is that, Colleen? That's a, that's a great question. and and. At, around the country, you're seeing a lot more women running, and you know, Time Magazine had a, a cover story about the unprecedented number of women candidates. But for whatever reason, at, at this moment in, in Kansas and Missouri, you're not seeing that same surge, and, and also in, in Johnson County. And so I, I think that's something for uh, leaders in, in both states to talk about and, and ask themselves, because there just aren't a lot of women on the ballot running for top offices this year. And uh, what was the response, Jay, to the story that you ran when you did that survey? Did you get backlash? for that? You know, there, there are a few uh, people who came forward and said, you know, it, it, the person's color, sex, background, whatever, should have no uh, bearing on whether they're able to serve in the job or not. And that's true. But if you are a, a diverse community, uh, it is important to have people in those roles making decisions about where your community is heading in the future that represent the, all the backgrounds. And that is our week in review. Our thanks to our news reviewers. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at KCBT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.